Hi there. Pleased to be with you. I'm wondering how many of you are planning to be with us over the Memorial Day weekend in Paris Landing, Tennessee. You can find information about the whole event on borntowin.net under events. And be sure and drop us a note if you're coming, especially those of you who are doing the weekend Bible study with us, because we sure like to say hello and shake hands. And some of you I know I've probably never met before. So the family retreat, Paris Landing, Tennessee, over the Memorial Day weekend. We're going to have a blast. Well, we're fully settled in now, I think I can say, from the move. And everything is starting to catch up. Everyone's starting to catch up on a lot of stuff that, you know how it is, you put things off. You, you There are things you don't absolutely have to do right now because we do have to get the office organized. Well, we got it. We're there. And so now everybody's starting to catch up on the odds and ends. If you uh, had to drive into our office, you feel like you're doing a little mountain climbing coming up our front driveway. But that will be better once they get the road out front finished. That's our next thing that we're putting up with here in Tyler. I should say in White House. All is well, though, and we're looking forward to things improving. I don't have any questions this week, but I had an an email from Peter Kamen in Long Island, New York. I think Peter's in Long Island. He's somewhere around New York City. He said, I want to offer a comment regarding your explanation of the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. While I do agree with you that the bottom line of the principle of this parable would be in Abraham's reply to the rich man. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Peter says, I think that Jesus' statement in Luke 16, 14 actually reveals the context of the parable is often overlooked. With apologies to our friend, Mr. Nelson, I'm using the new King James Version of the Bible. And if you're new, you won't know what he's talking about, but that's all right. Quoting from from Luke 16, verse 14. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Jesus then affirms the stability of the law and the prophets, and in verse 19 he launches into the parable in question. The whole parable, Peter says, concerns an example of someone so in love with the riches of this world that he's become hardened to the point that he could actually feast in the presence of a person dying from starvation to the point of begging for crumbs of leftover food. The fictional conversation taking place between Abraham and the rich man in the afterlife is most likely a scenario from Jesus appealing to the beliefs of the Hellenistic Jews of his day. That, I think, is true. When you harmonize this parable with the sheep and the goats of Matthew 25, 31, I think it becomes obvious that Jesus is emphasizing the importance of compassion and love for one another. If a person fails to produce this fruit, as Paul said later to the Corinthians, nothing else really matters. And, of course, this is contained in Moses and the prophets over and over again. Right you are, Peter, and thanks for pointing that out. Because contextually, you really can't dismiss that thing about the, the scribes and the Pharisees who loved riches. And the example that follows where a very wealthy man can enjoy himself and eat to the full while he has to walk by, really, every day, a man sitting outside his gate who is begging for crumbs of food. What kind of a person is this? Well, as I said, there are no questions this week, so we'll dive straight into Mark 12. And he began to speak to them by parables. A certain man, he said, planted a vineyard. And he set a hedge all around it and dug a place for the wine vat, built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And at the season, he sent to the husbandman a servant that he might receive from these husbandmen of the fruit of the vineyard, get his share. They caught him, beat him, and sent him away with nothing. Now, are you catching his drift yet? Who are these men? And who is the servant who is sent who got mistreated in this particular parable? He said, again, he sent them another servant. And at him they cast stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. 
he sent another. This one they killed, and many others beating some and killing some. Now, you know, it doesn't take you long to realize that this this is a fictional account. It's something that Jesus has sort of put together as a story, an allegory, to make a point to these people. But who are these people? Who is the great landlord? Who is the person who shared this out or leased it out to these people and expected to get something and got nothing? And who are these people who are continually being sent and mistreated? Well, Jesus gave us another clue to this in Matthew 23, verse 37, when he said this, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets and stone them that are sent to you, how often would I have gathered your children together like a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, You shall not see me any more until you say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now, when you begin to put this stuff together, you can kind of see, looking back through time, that the people who really managed the temple, the people who were the priesthood, the heart and the core of Judaism and the practice of the cult of Judaism in the temple, these were the people to whom God had entrusted his word and had given the responsibility for taking care of the people. And when he sent him a prophet, they mistreated him. When he sent a prophet, they beat him. When he sent a man like Jeremiah, this incredible man, they wound up putting him down in a septic tank up to his armpits in the sludge down there and left him there to die in that situation. Okay, the landlord has yet a son his well-beloved, and he sent them to him and saying, ah, well, I'm going to send him to my son because they will will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, ah, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. Now, what therefore will the Lord of the vineyard do? (laughs) What would you expect that he would do? And why, in a way, do you think he's waited so long to get around to doing it? Well, he said he will come and destroy the husbandman and give the vineyard to somebody else. And haven't you read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Now, I thought this was interesting. Matthew tells this story a little differently. He has it in Matthew 21, verse 40. When the Lord, therefore, the vineyard comes... What will he do to those wicked husbandmen? Now, Matthew has it phrased as a question to the people who were sitting there listening to him. And they said to him, Oh, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. He'll let out his vineyard to other husbandmen that will render the fruit in their seasons. There's a terrible irony here. This is one parable that the people it was pointed at understood. They got it. They got it to such an extent that they tried to lay hold on him. They didn't because they were afraid of the people. Why? Because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. And they left him and went away. You know, it's, it's really something to consider what this parable means. Because in the time past, God had planted Israel in the land. He gave them the land of Canaan. He said, farm it, produce you know, from it. Give me the first fruits, but everything else is yours. He set up the land by lots. He gave people, ensured their inheritance of the land down through generations and so forth. He actually left it in their care, and they forgot about him. And when he sent prophets to them, they killed them. They beat them. They treated them badly again and again and again. But then here is the thing you have to think about. He says, when the Lord comes, he's going to take this thing away from them and give it to someone else. And one can only conclude that when Jesus said this, we are right then on the cusp of history where everything was going to change and where the keepers of Judaism would no longer be the people who spoke for God who took care of his people, and all that was entailed in that. There is in this parable 
a strong hint of the fact that from now on, the Gentiles are going to have their turn. Verse 13. They sent to him certain of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. And they came and said, Master, we know that you are true and care for no man. For you don't regard the person of man, but you teach the way of God in truth. I wonder how they could actually get those words out of their mouth. Although the words were true, they asked them then, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Now, this apparently was a big issue among Jews at the time. Do we pay taxes to Caesar or are we, we violating some eternal principle? Shall we give or shall we not give? But Jesus, knowing their hypocrisy, the Greek word, by the way, for hypocrite is actor, play actor, knowing that they were pretending, said to them, Why are you tempting me? Bring me a penny so I can see it. So they brought it, and he said, Whose image is this, the superscription on this coin? They said to him, It's Caesar's. And Jesus answering said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. And that's where we are today. I mean, there are certain things that we do owe the government because the government builds our roads and takes care of it and provides for our security. And so taxes are a reasonable way for a government to do that. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Now, it's almost like a tag team match here, because when these guys got to be, here come the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, and they take their turn. They say, Master Moses wrote to us, If a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him, and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. The whole idea seems to have been that, um, you know, a man gets married to a wife and he doesn't have any children and he dies. Normally, there's an inheritance that would come to this man and consequently to his children. And so what he's saying here is that his brother should take her as a wife. And there was nothing terribly unusual in these days about a man having more than one wife. And he was supposed to raise up seed that is a child that was born here would be considered by law the child of his brother. The law in question is Deuteronomy 25, verse 5. If brethren dwell together and one of them die and has no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry outside to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her, take him to him to wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn she bears shall succeed in the name of the brother that is dead, so his name is not put out of Israel. It's really interesting. It's, there seems to be a, a genealogical question, and there certainly is a hereditary question. It comes up in the book of Ruth, interestingly enough, with a challenge having to do with how you pass on the land and how you can even screw up your own inheritance in, in the process. Then he says, if the man doesn't want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to raise up to his brother a name in Israel. He'll not perform the duty of my husband's brother. The elders of the city shall call him and speak to him. And if he stand to it and say, I don't want to take her to be my wife. Then she comes to him in the presence of the elders, takes his shoe off his foot, spits in his face, and shall say, so it shall be done to the man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him that has his shoe loosed. You know, he didn't kill, but he's publicly shamed. And and a blot, in a way, is put on his name because he did this. Why wouldn't he have done it? The primary reason, I think, would be because he would want to succeed himself to his brother's inheritance, perhaps. But this is not what was supposed to be done. There's a lot of things in this that we kind of guess at, and historians and biblical scholars have applied themselves to it, but I can't honestly say that anybody has come up with a conclusive answer to it. The reason is simple. It's sociologically based. It has to do with the inheritance of the land, and there's just too much that we don't know. But this is the law that they are citing to Jesus, and here is the question that they raise in verse 20. Of Mark 12. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died, leaving no seed. The second took her and died, and neither left he any seed. And the third likewise, and the seven that had her and left no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. 
In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, remember the Sadducees didn't believe it was going to happen. They're trying to pose the impossible question. Whose wife then shall she be of him? For the seven had her to wife. And Jesus answered, Aren't you making a mistake because you don't know the Scriptures, neither the power of God? What a slap in the face. And you know, this is where a lot of trouble comes with people. They really don't know the Scriptures. You would think they did. And I, I sub, sometimes find today, when I try to talk to people about, about uh, Scriptures and doctrinal issues and what have you, I just get the feeling sometimes that the constant reading of the Bible is not a part of people's lives. They don't have the big picture. They're fine when it comes to running down their proof texts. And they can drag you all over the Bible with proof texts here and there. But a grasp of the context of them, a grasp of the grand context of the Bible, the nature of God, what God is doing, where he's going, what he's trying to accomplish, seems to be lost on them. Well, Jesus said, when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels in heaven. Oh, well, that's the end of their question. And you would have thought they would have realized that that was going to be the case from the start. But apparently, they did not. Anyway, and as touching the dead, Jesus said, Have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? Well, yeah, we know that. Then he said, He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Therefore, you do greatly err. And one of the things he's trying to tell these people is, is really quite simply, you're making a big mistake here because the scriptures that you don't seem to have read enough of tell you that there is going to have to be a resurrection of the dead. And it's in that sense that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not the dead. Oh, yeah, they were dead all right, but there's going to be raised from the dead. Well, one of the scribes, having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had really answered them well, said, which is the first commandment of all? This guy comes in from left field, as it were. He, he, he's, there's, a, there's an honesty about him because he sees, he listens and goes through that, and he says, They've, he's really handled this. And he says, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus said, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it, namely this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And, of course, we've long understood, and I don't know how many sermons I've heard on over the years, of the fact that these two divisions point to the divisions in the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments have to do with loving God, the last six commandments have to do with how we treat one another. Pretty simple stuff. And the scribe said to him, Well, Master, you have said the truth, for there is one God and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and all the soul and all the strength and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And Jesus, when he saw, he answered discreetly, said to him, You're not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any questions. It's almost as though, like I said, like a tag team match. They went in and out, in and out. One person would ask, another person would ask. And he left them all standing there in, in, in tatters. And they finally decided they had better give up. Jesus answered and said while he was teaching in the temple, how is it the scribes say that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, by the way, that this follows on this one God statement that is made here. Listen to this. David says by the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit on my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. David, therefore, himself calls him Lord. How can he then be his son? And the common people heard him gladly. The others, not so well. Because what Jesus is saying here in that interesting little contrast, the son of David would not normally be called Lord by David. Lordship goes from son to father and up, right? Well, 
he says, here's something you don't understand, and you need to. And I say, this is a very interesting statement here, coming on the heels of the statement about this there being one God, for what Jesus is opening the door briefly to is the fact that he himself is also David's Lord. And he said to them in his teaching, Beware of the scribes, which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and the uppermost rooms at the feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. Now, I really can only take this one way, that the pretense of religion followed by the abuse of the poor and of widows is a much more serious crime than your old poor, old dyed-in-the-wool non-religious extortioner who takes advantage of the poor and of widows. One will be punished, the other more punished more severely because of his pretense at religion. And Jesus sat opposite the treasury, and he watched how people were casting money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast a lot of money in there. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites which make a farthing. I, I can only conclude, you must be talking about, I would have said at one time two pennies, but with inflation, let's say two nickels or two dimes. He called to him his disciples and said to them, Verily I say unto you, this poor widow has cast more in than all they that have cast into the treasury. For they cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even her living. And you know, I, I get from this that in God's eyes, what you give seen as a percentage or as in ratio to your overall ability to give is the credit that falls to your account from God. Not in the raw dollars, not in the raw size of the gift or the silver or the gold, but in the size of the gift in relation to what you've got. That's fair. And when you're talking about spiritual matters, you're talking about how I'm going to hold spiritual credit to you for your generosity to God. Well, I've got to look at it in comparison to what you have. I think it's also important, I and mean, I think about it a lot because I notice the difference in what different people give to God. I read letters and I know that I, for example, got one guy from a prison, and you know what they, they make, what, 25 cents an hour or something like that for the work they do in there? Some guy in prison worked, I don't know how long he had to work for it, but he sent us $5 out of jail as a gift. He sent it because he knew he had to give something to God, and he knew that the raw amount of the gift didn't matter, that it was what sacrifice he personally had to make in order to do it. That's what God looked upon. I also think, though, there is a fact in being considered, and that is that God can take that little bit that he gave and make perhaps more of it than he could of a much richer gift from somebody who had more to give. It's worth giving some thought to. We'll grab a quick snack, and I'll be right back with Mark 13. As he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Master, look at the stones. Look at the buildings that are here. Look how they put this stuff together. And Jesus answering said to him, See all these great buildings? There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. I can't think of anything he could have said that would have, would have flabbergasted these men and took the air out of their sails any quicker than this. And when he got settled on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? How are we going to know when it's coming? Now, this is one of those instances where long familiarity with the Olivet Prophecy leads us to note the difference in wording between this gospel and another. It serves as an interesting illustration of what the method of inspiration of the New Testament might have been. 
Here's how Matthew 24, verse 3 reads about this particular thing. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, didn't say who they were, and said, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, that's, I think, it's remarkably different from what Mark records there. To me, the obvious record is that these men were not engaged in (laughs) auto-writing. This is a, you know, I don't know what you've heard about theories of the inspiration of scriptures. You can find them usually discussed in most, most Bible handbooks. But the thing I think we need to understand, that these men were not engaged in auto writing, which is called, and one website defined auto writing as a form of channeling, allowing information to be channeled through the hands or in thought form from our own higher self. Well, I think other people think maybe it comes from somebody in the spirit world. I honestly think some people think that the apostles sat down and by process of auto writing or of spirit writing, as the Holy Spirit kind of took possession of them and moved into their hand and wrote the words on the paper, this is how it took place. I don't think so. It seems plain enough when you read and you compare what's said everywhere. Just this little example right here. For example, where the disciples said, when shall these things be and what shall be the sign when these things shall be fulfilled? Matthew records what Jesus said as, Tell us when shall these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? That's different, significantly different. It seems plain enough to me that the Spirit inspired, that is, moved these men to write, and saw to it that they wrote the truth, and then took hands off. This is not necessarily true of the prophets, but I think it is generally true of the New Testament writings. The best way to approach the four Gospels is to hear them as witnesses. Some ideas of biblical inerrancy stumble over this rock because both Matthew and Luke cannot be accurate, strictly speaking. If they were accurate, they would have recorded Jesus' words exactly the same way. But they both tell the truth. Look at it this way. Can you be entirely accurate and still mislead someone? Oh, you know you can. You've been able to do that ever since you were a kid, whenever you told your mother you know, something that was absolutely accurate, but led her to the conclusion you wanted instead of to the truth. So when you actually are accurate but mislead someone, are you being truthful? This is the great curse of our political process these days is our people up there talking to us are being accurate, but they are not being truthful. Uh, Sometimes they're not even accurate, but that's another story. Perhaps it's better to describe the inspiration of the Bible as ensuring truth, not inerrancy. In court, If all the witnesses use exactly the same words to describe an event, you should be immediately suspicious that they have been coached. Because this is a fact of life. It is the truth, and you know it's true. Each person witnesses an event differently. So if they are telling us the truth, and if they have not been coached, their stories will differ. But it's not a question of accuracy. It's a question of truth. It is only in a multitude of witnesses that the truth finally emerges. If one witness tells you what he knows to be true, and then he leaves, another witness comes in and tells you what he knows to be true, when you put these two stories together, you may end up knowing something that neither one of the witnesses knew because you can merge their accounts together and begin to understand how it's possible for them both to be true even though they didn't see the same thing. Well, Jesus answered them, his disciples, and said, Well, take heed lest any man deceive you. Many will come in my name, saying I am Christ, and shall deceive many. There's an ambiguity in the way this is worded in all the Gospels. That, you know, people wonder, does he mean someone's going to come and he's going to say, quote, I'm the Christ, and deceive many? Or does he mean someone's going to come in my, in my name, that is, and by my authority, saying that I really am Christ, that is, Mr. A says Jesus is Christ, that he will deceive many. 
I don't know. You can look at it either way. The point is, an awful lot of people are going to be deceived about Christ and about these events. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, be not troubled. Such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. You know, I remember World War II. I was sitting out on the porch one, one warm summer night listening to my betters and my adults talk about the war that was going on at the time. And they were talking about wars and rumors of wars from the Bible. And they were concerned that, that the wars that were going on right then, maybe it was a sign of the end. And it's funny how few people pay attention to what Jesus said. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. It's going to happen. But that doesn't mean the end is here. Not yet. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There shall be famines. There shall be troubles. These boys are only the beginning. Not the end, just the beginning. I've heard people cite this and say, oh, well, there have been earthquakes and wars and famines. There have been those in time immemorial. How can they be a sign of the time of the end? Well, yeah. That's what Jesus says. This isn't the sign of the end. It's just the beginning. Watch yourself, Jesus said, for they, they'll deliver you up to councils. In the synagogues you shall be beaten, and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake for a testimony against them. Now, I don't know how it is that we in our, our world and our time think that we're going to escape this. I, you know, it just seems impossible that we could escape it because the, those guys back in that time didn't. Now, it may not be synagogues that we're taken into and we may not be beaten, but we're liable to find wind up in jail or fined or something like that for what we say. It's getting that way in Canada right now. I think that, you know, I've heard that one big ministry, which has a lot of radio all over the country and in Canada, is actually changing the format of their program so they can play it in Canada. Why? Because you can't say that homosexuality is sinful behavior, not in Canada, not in public. And sooner or later, you know, if they get away with this in Canada, if it begins to come down across the border into our country, sooner or later, they're going to try to stop us from telling the truth. Now, homosexuality may be one aspect of it, but if that's hate, hate speech, then for us to say that fornication is a sin is hate speech, then adultery is a sin is hate speech. I don't know. Why can't we say that uh, embezzlement is a sin? Well, they, that's bad news because that affects business. But the truth of the matter is that somewhere along the line, some of us are going to have to stand up and tell the truth, even if it means being brought before rulers or judges for his sake for a testimony against them. has to happen. Get used to the idea. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. When they lead you up and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak. Don't bother planning it. Don't premeditate. Because when you come up against that, the Holy Spirit will give you right then in that hour what to say. It won't be you that's speaking. It'll be the Holy Spirit. But brother shall betray brother to death, the father the son. Children will rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. It happened historically. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. But when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it shouldn't be, let him that reads understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him that's on the housetop not go down into his house. Don't enter. Don't take anything out of his house. If you're out in the field, don't go back home again for your clothes. Just get out. Interesting that what is said here, let him that reads understand. I take that as an editorial remark by Mark, not something that Jesus said himself, because he uses the word reads. Jesus was speaking. He wouldn't have said that in that circumstance. So... And, and the caution about this is that the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet was fulfilled way back in history. It would be fulfilled again in their immediate future in 70 A.D., and the implication is it's going to be fulfilled one more time out there somewhere. And Jesus went on 
Woe to them that are with child. Woe to them that give suck and nurse children in those days. Oh, it's going to be bad for nursing mothers. Don't And pray that your flight be not in the winter. For in those days there shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time, and it will never be. One time, unique in all of history. You know, this is a marker right here. There is one day unique in all of history. And if you go back through the prophets, you will tend to find that same day spoken of. And what Jesus is saying, it is still ahead of us at this time. Now, a lot of people believe that all this was fulfilled in 70 A.D. when the temple fell. In type, it certainly was. But because it's happened before, it's probably going to have happened again. Now, the interesting thing about this, I've spoken of it before, is that whenever Jeremiah was prophesying to the people in his own day, and he was standing in the gate of the temple, and here's this magnificent temple behind him, Solomon's temple. And he says, don't you think in your heart to say, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. And I see him sweeping his hand around the buildings that were there. And he himself prophesied the destruction of that very building. Well, it got built back again. Now, here's Jesus standing in the second temple. And his disciples are pointing out all these things like country boys, which they were country boys. And Jesus said, it's going to happen again. It's going to be torn down again. And a lot of people think that there will be, before Christ's return, yet another temple built. And it, too, will be torn down. This is the thing that may be out there somewhere, but I emphasized maybe because there is no way we can be certain about what's coming down in the future. I think it's important for us to know these things, though, because if we know them, we may recognize what's happening when it begins to come to pass when the rest of the world is completely at sea. And Jesus went on to say, Except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he has chosen, he has shortened the days. Moffat translation has no flesh be saved alive because that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about salvation. He's talking about flesh being saved. And if it wasn't shortened, mankind would be wiped out. That's the implication of this. And you know that has never been possible in history until now. Romans 9, verse 27 says something interesting. Paul wrote, Isaiah also cries concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work, cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Just another way of talking about what Christ said, unless the Lord shortened the days, no one would survive. And then if any man will say to you, lo, here's Christ, or lo, he is over there, don't believe him. False Christ, there's no question what he's talking about here, and false prophets shall arise, and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Now, he suggests that it's really not possible to seduce the elect. These are people who receive the love of the truth, are dedicated to truth, and aren't going to believe something if they don't see it in the Bible. But watch. I have foretold you all things, but in those days after the tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, the moon will not give her light, and the stars of heaven will fall, the powers that are in the heaven shall be shaken, and then they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Wow, boy, what a description to think about that. And what your emotions would be when it starts... Because I gather you won't see the sign of the Son of Man coming until this is already well underway. Then he shall send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Now I believe this tells us what Jesus means when he speaks of the elect. Because of the fact that they are being gathered around for all the four winds, it means he's talking about the resurrection and the change of the saints. It's the saints he's talking about not physical Israel. The word saint means set apart, which is another way of saying they are elected. 
Now learn the parable of the fig tree, Christ went on. When her branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you in like manner, when you shall see these things come to pass, know it's near, even at the doors. How would you see them coming to pass, though, if you're not reading your Bible? And I don't mean just reading Mark and Matthew on the Olivet Prophecy. I mean going back through all the prophets to get the big picture of what God does, why he does it, and how he does it. You do all that, when it starts happening, you will know what's coming down. Others won't. Verily I say unto you that this generation, and by that I think he means the generation that sees these events start, shall not pass till everything is finished. Heaven and earth shall pass away. My words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knows no man, know not the angels in heaven, neither the Son, only the Father. So why on earth do people persist in thinking they've figured all that out? I think if, you know, if we were allowed to do so, we could stone somebody who stands up and says and gives us a date that Christ is coming back. Well, the least we could do is pelt him with donuts or something. Anyway, take heed, watch, pray, for you don't know when the time is. For the Son of Man is like a man taking a far journey who left his house, gave authority to his servants, to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch, therefore, for you don't know what hour the master of the house comes, whether it's going to be at even or midnight or the cock crowing or in the morning. And don't think that means you can't, that, that you're going to know the day, you just don't know what hour of the day. That's silly. Jesus is saying, live your life you don't know. And the way I put it to people is you need to maintain an, a, an alert in your life. You may need to maintain a discipline of watching that you can maintain over time. Not that you plan on selling things off by a certain date and being all cleared up. God doesn't care when you sell all your stuff off. That's not important. What you want is him not to come suddenly and find you sleeping, not paying attention. I say unto all of you, watch. Now, we used to talk about, about, well, watch world events. That's true. But watching world events is not going to mean a blasted thing to you if you don't read your Bible. Whole books at a time. Study the Word. Don't go just chasing around a bunch of proof texts. Read the book in context. You stay with it, and when the time comes, you'll know. Well, there are no questions this week, so I'll remind you, send your questions and your comments to ron at borntowin.net, and I'm signing off. I'll see you next weekend.